In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him, and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake, he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. But the way of the ungodly shall perish. Welcome to His House of Learning. This is your host, Christian M.C. Fulmer. Today we're going over Flourishing Schools, Part 1, ACSI Psychoeducation. Now I'm not being hyperbolic, considering that it's based on psychology and the social science of psychometrics. Getting into that shortly, this will be a part one of three series, in which case I'll be sh showcasing Flourishing Together by Lynn Swanner and Andy Wolf. Lynn Swanner, as a reminder, representative of the Association of, of Christian Schools International, and Andy Wolf is an executive of the Church of England Schools. Part 1 will be going over Flourishing Schools, which is an official, I have to say fairly large, survey research conducted by, by ACSI back in 2019, 2018 to 19 to be more exact, prior the pandemic. Although, a lot of this would come to this full swing the year following. If anything, well, you can't let a crisis go to waste, justifying the nature of this educational beast. We'll be getting into, in next episode, part two, Andy Wolf's side of things, especially from that perspective of the Church of England, from a document that was actually written and conducted in 2020, post-pandemic, post-pandemic, after all the shutdowns and whatnot, and it is going to be, t and these two, these two educational philosophies, I'll co coalesce into flourishing together, which was published in 2021, the following year, and it has taken off quite a bit in last year in 2022 and it's coming to more prominence in 23. But really, why am I sharing all this? Because this is the future of mainstream, private Christian, so-called Christian edu education. This is the law ACSI, Church of England, as well as their partners in crime from Canada, CARDIS. We're talking about hundreds of schools, thousands of teachers, millions, of students that are being directly influenced by this and the key term that they all share is the common good well what does flourishing mean well let's go to first media source 
This is Dr. Swanner herself. I'm, she's going to give you a little bit of taste of what flourishing is. But mind you, the reason why, <laughs> as you look around, you are probably not too impressed by the layout of this channel and whatnot, but the key thing is I want to avoid as much stimulation as possible, and really just something that's, that's what we here at His House of Learning do. Hence, the, hence, if you look at our logo down below, you see that we have the Holy Bible, preferably the 1611 King authorized King James Version, or anything of that of which is written through the Tectus Receptacus, the received text. So that includes the Geneva Bible and, well, to a degree, the Bishop's Bible as well, if you want to go a little more old school. But <laughs> so I'm not leaving out my Puritan brethren. I admire your Bible too. In fact, I have a rather large copy in my library as well that I refer to every now and then. Because I do appreciate the Puritans for as radical as they could be at times. But, yes, so the Holy Bible, the foundation of history, politics, economy, and true religion. Now then, getting back to Dr. Schwanner. Let's see what she has to say for herself. But first, she's going to give us a little bit of visual, audiovisual, and that's the thing. You have to be careful whenever you view and listen to things, especially when it comes with psychologically, you know, you know emotionally stimulating music. One must guard your eyes, your ears, your mind, as well as your heart. Thank you, Daniel. Well, welcome everyone this morning. It is truly an honor and a privilege to be with you. So I originally hail from New York, but I live outside of Philadelphia, so traveled a bit to get to your wonderful province, been mostly to the Maritimes and sort of on the East Coast uh, to Montreal and also Ontario. So it is my first time out here. It is beautiful, it is wonderful, and it's a privilege and a blessing to be with you today. So I wanna start out by just acknowledging how interesting it is for us to be talking about flourishing during a time that for most classroom teachers and school leaders perhaps has been uh, the most challenging two years of your career. And it's my prayer and it's my hope that during this uh, convention today that you'll be blessed, that you'll be encouraged, and that you'll be strengthened. And for that purpose, before I start today to share a little bit about the research that we've done on flourishing and how it can inform uh, your work in the classroom, I'd love to share an encouraging video. Now before we watch this, bear in mind that this Research was conducted over a period of about at least two years and involved, and you can check this out on the ACSI website, they will tell you, about a quarter million dollar budget. Now that may not seem that impressive, but bear in mind for a survey of this caliber, a quarter million dollars is actually above average for most research endeavors. And realistically, I mean, just to ask people questions on a mass scale, especially in the digital age, a quarter million dollars is you should be able to get quite a bit done. And they did. We'll get into that. In a nutshell, 15,000 respondents. We'll get into that in detail. But for now, I want you to listen carefully. Because this is the kind of theology, of educational philosophy, that is pervading through the culture of the Western world, especially within the Anglosphere. In summary... I argue Christian humanism. This isn't wokeism. Wokeism is the ugly fruit of humanism. But this is Christian humanism. It sounds very much like the Bible, very much similar to that of the gospel. But they are but there are antichrist elements afoot. The serpent is subtle. We'll be looking at documents, amongst other things later. You'll see what I mean. Truly, the fruit of these roots. Speaking of roots, no pun intended. How do we grow? By strength or resolve? Can we make it so? 
Can we shape the course of our lives according to our purpose and designs? Or add a single hour to the measure of our time? How can we ever venture into what is unknown when we are incapable of the smallest change on our own? Capable of the smallest change on our own. So, so far, right? Seems pretty sound. But what do these things mean? What are the turning points? What is the solution? Looking back over the span of our lives, we can see the marks that testify to how far we've come, how much we've grown, how much of His grace we have been shown. The marks of maturity on our lives, the evidence of the work of Christ. Question. What does His grace entail? And what kind of work are we talking about? These are questions you always need to ask whenever you're introduced to something that doesn't directly refer to scripture. Platitudes, people. Platitudes. We live in a culture, we live in a world of platitudes. And they're, and see the thing, a lot of them are, that's, the ugliness that you see out there, it doesn't just come from depraved and degenerate minds. It's also made permissible and is made possible, excusable, by theology, by a religion that, well, you'll see. The seed that he has planted in our heart, the Lord has also watered and will refine every part. It is his intention to give it growth. Until it comes to fruition, he has sealed it with his oath. Okay. Lovely, right? That he who began this good work in you will see it through. So far, like, great, right? Great. This is, this is, but you must always be alert. You must make sure that you weigh every word, including my words. Including my words. That's why I'll be referring to quite a bit of scripture here, as I always should be. As I always should be. In this lies our hope, not in what we do. But we do not grow alone. We do not grow alone. How so? Our roots are intertwined, one with another, so that your strength is mine. We'll be testing those words in due time. While we wait in expectation, no growth can be seen. The tender shoots that so quickly spring up must grow strong. While we wait in expectation, no growth can be seen. Okay, so that is already a yellow turning into a red flag. Because what the scriptures say, you shall know them, his followers, by what? Their fruit. By their works, by their lives. Their very existence should be an evidence for whether or not they are truly followers of Christ. And like, and like she's saying, there is growth, so it's not going to happen overnight. But what she said was what? It's unseen. See, that's the thing. That's not what people are should be looking out for. Well, we can't see it. After all, only God can read the hearts and minds of men. That's very true. But he also makes it very clear to us to encourage each other and hold each other accountable according to our fruit, our works. Lest they remain frail and green. Would we be overwhelmed by perils in store that his timing seeks to prepare us for? Let us endure our trials with patience, for it's in his goodness that we trust 
and hold fast to our commitment, resting in his faithfulness to us. His goal is for our good. On this, our assurance falls. His goal is for our good. His goal is for our good. That is secondary. His goal is for His, the Lord God, Jesus Christ. The Creator, the Redeemer, the Judge. His glory. That's the primary thing. There's plenty of scripture we'll be going to to support that. It's true. His our good is in his mind, is is in his will. But that's not the goal. That he who began this good work will surely make it grow tall. Another thing to note too is when you read through flourishing to, together and we'll be going over that in more detail in episode three and there's also going to be a few references here in this episode as well as the next there's a number of references to imitation of nature there's a rather <laughs> a rather uh, esoteric light in environmental theology that's incorporated here well, more so that examples of that towards the end as you know that will branch no pun intended I do that often branch off of this one in the near future so yeah I didn't edit that edit it that way that's how it is normally in the video anyways I hope for me, that was a very encouraging video. I hope it encouraged you and it's a good start for today, but I just want to pull out a few quotes from this video that you may have missed. Yeah, let's, uh, let's uh, review these quotes because this, is, this will be a pretty good you know, topic to keep in mind throughout this. Uh, the first is, God is the author who planted the seed, waters it, and refines it in our lives. It is his intention to give it growth. So it's his, his goal, his design for us to grow in him. We do not grow alone. Our roots are intertwined with one another so that your strength is mine. And the theme today will be flourishing together. Looking at the tender shoots, we don't always see growth. They must grow strong, though for now they are frail and green. And so what we'll encourage you to do today is, as you think about the challenges of the last couple of years, to notice where God has uh, cause seeds in your life to grow and to oh and just as a disclaimer this video this video this seminar was conducted the last year 2022 so a few years following the pandemic okay let's turn our attention over to actually oops sorry about that there we go Flourishing Schools, Research on Christian School Culture and Community. We'll be getting to Psalm 115 pretty soon. Because, as you can imagine, I'm pacing myself with the scripture because this being a quote-unquote Christian you know, educational philosophy, it does come, well, supposedly rooted in scripture throughout the way. In fact, a number of the references that we'll be making are key ones that are made in that video as well as the book so these are so we'll be looking at some key theme verses or parts of verses as you'll see soon the flourishing schools research on christian school culture community conducted in 2018 through 19. technically started a little sooner than you know than that but got really full swing during that during that academic year all right let's Let's look at the authors. About the authors, Lenny Swainer, amongst other things, by the way, she graduated from Columbia University. You know, Columbia University, that speaks volumes in itself. We'll get more into that in the next episode, especially the third. 
you know, second and third part of the series, but more importantly, she is a Cardis Senior Fellow. Cardis Senior Fellow. I've done some work on Cardis already, but essentially they are the counterparts to ACSI, as well as the Church of England, and they are based in Canada. And they are very much like their two partner schools in the Anglosphere, in the Western world, promoters of the common good. They don't refer to the term flourishing as much, but they do share in such a mindset. And there's Charlie A. Marshall, PhD, professor of psychology, and this is a little tidbit, Sherry A. Tesser, worship program director. So I guess one thing I want to really take note of the fact that you have uh, this circle of Christian humanism, of compromise with that of the common good amongst and, and you know and religious pluralism, psychology, and the fact that this is an all-female research team. Now, of course, there were males on it in the big scheme, but well, you'll see. All right, let's look at the. Key things in the executive summary highlighted in green. Oops, sorry about that. Here, let's just turn this. Let's just turn me off for the time being, so we can read th read through this. More flexibly, okay. The flourishing school culture instruments. F S C I. Questions for the F S C I were formed based on cataloged findings from extensive review of relevant prior research and literature. By the way, majority of it not Christian, based on psychology, humanism, and the like, as well as findings from a meta-analysis of leading Christian schools' expected student outcomes, which fell into six major domains, spiritual, academic, community, excellence, impact, and servanthood. So through the lens of mainstream social science, they asked about the expected outcomes of their student body. So bear in mind, this was not done through a theological lens, especially that through scripture that came afterwards, but more on that soon. Everything will be soon, everything will be soon. One thing at a time. The FSCM clusters the valid dated constructs for all seven survey groups into five domains of flourishing. Purpose, purpose-driven life, Rick Warren, that was something that came out back in the, after two, back around a, a little before 2000, for 2010, but really took off closer to it. Relationships, yeah, and basically it's the same idea, people. It's really, it, it really is. It hasn't, if you're probably wondering, well, that was, that was half my lifetime ago. Well, my lifetime, I'm 32 now, but no, it's same thing, just under different names and takes. Relationships, learning out or learning orientation, not learning, learning orientation. Remember, there's sexual orientation amongst other things. I think now there's even racial orientation now in some circles expertise and resources, and well-being. These domains provide a compelling and comprehensive picture of the areas in which Christian schools can focus their efforts and resources in order to promote a flourishing school culture and community. Let's go over here first. So data analysis conducted was first, reliability and validity were tested for the FSCI items to produce a final subset of the original pre-validated questions resulting in a psychometrically sound instrument. Second, the, st the statistical power, they mentioned power quite a bit, it's pretty much a part of the culture now, right? Everybody wants power these days. Second, the, st the statistical power behind the FSCI construction and analysis, particularly linkage linkages to outcomes, enables the instrument to be a predictive versus correlative measure. And finally, the validated constructs identified through the FSCI data and analysis were mapped onto the first ever research-based model of Christian school flourishing, the flourishing school culture model, FSCM. 
The FSCM clusters are validated constructs for all seven. Yeah, sorry about that. We already read that. Doesn't matter if we read it out of order, but you understand it's psychometrically. So basically, what feelings, expectations, assumptions. You'll see what I mean soon. Some findings, however, so last little paragraph here on the right, some findings, however, suggested schools pursue other culture-shaping efforts to promote flourishing, such as leaders engaging the larger community, ensuring teachers are oriented towards best practice, oriented towards best practice, and promoting teachers' engagement of students in deeper learning. Deeper learning, it's another... Uh, it's a different kind of critical thinking, which by the way, critical thinking comes from critical theory in the future, hopefully by next month, Lord willing, I'm already working towards it. I'll be doing an entire uh, th audiovisual thesis of what critical thinking is and is no friend to the Christian man or the free man. Let's go to the background. Thanks to, oops, sorry about that. Thanks to a generous two-year grant from a private foundation, I could not figure out who exactly it was, ACSI research staff developed and launched the FSCI in fall 2018. The FSCI was constructed as an exploratory instrument to develop a predictive model, predictive model of school flourishing. Remember those models that they were using or the pandemic, amongst other things. Gotta follow the models, follow the science people. Between fall 2018 and early spring 2019, over 15,000 completed responses were collected, representing 280 24-hour 24 24 days of response time from 65 diverse school communities. Later on, they'll, criticize, they'll, they'll subtly criticize the fact that those schools could, could be more diverse, but I digress. Flourishing offers a more expansive view of the purposes and processes of education. Fun fact, they never really direct give a direct... Ooh, they pretty much never give a direct... Uh, sorry. Blipped a little bit. Anywho. They never really give a direct definition of what flourishing entails, but they do describe it quite a bit. But here are some three key verses, Psalm 115.14, John 10.10b, and John 15.5b. We'll go over the John later on, but for now, let's look at Psalm 115.14. It says, throughout, or so right, or so right around it, it says, throughout scripture, the concept of flourishing is used to describe a state of being, one that always results from God's work with and upon communities of faith. Notice she says communities of faith. That doesn't mean exclusively, devoutly Christian, Bible-believing Christian, by the way. The psalmist invokes the blessing of the Old Testament. May the Lord cause you to flourish, both you and your children. Keep in mind that the ACSI uses the NIV in fact, uh, if we go up above here, in this study, they use the NIV about half the time, and then the rest of it could be pretty much anything. Here we are, see? Here we are, yeah, if you look very carefully un un towards the middle, unless otherwise indicated, all scripture quotations are taken from the Holy Bible New International Version. So it's gonna be either the NIV or really anything else. That could be ESV, they've also done Message, they've done Amplified, they've done the New Century. I think it's called the NCB, the New Century version. But yeah, essentially, but that's the thing. That's why for me, if you have to bounce around with your Bible translations in order to get verses and passages that suit what you're trying to communicate, you have to be suspicious. You have to wonder why. So yeah, so NIV, may the Lord cause you to flourish, both you and, and, and your children, Psalm 115, 14. Okay, so let's look at Psalm 115, King James Version. 
and see what it says because let's see here let's go over let's let's go over down yonder and so what you should always do is when they for people reference a verse or if, or if you read around it read around it so we're going to start with verse 10 the second half there's 18 verses start with verse 10 and see what verse 14 what verse 14 really entails when it comes to this so-called flourishing O house of Aaron trust in the Lord he is their help and their shield ye that fear the Lord trust in the Lord he is their help and their shield the Lord hath been mindful of us he will bless us he will bless us the house of Israel he will bless the house of Aaron he will bless them that fear the Lord both small and great the Lord shall increase you more and more you and your children bear in mind that's predominantly referring to multiplication as well as the prosperity of which to sustain life but we're talking about a modest prosperity if you read through scripture carefully the Lord is not too keen about making everybody quote-unquote wealthy because we tend to forget about him when we think we have more than we need all day every day as if we just pull levers and we have things anywho verse 15 onwards ye are blessed of the lord which made heaven and earth the heaven even the heavens are the lord's but the earth hath he given to the children of men the dead praise not the lord neither any that go down into silence but we will bless the lord from this time forward and forevermore praise the lord so who will the lord increase who who will we help be fruitful and multiply those who fear him indeed those who praise him forevermore and remember back in the video the emphasis was not on the guy you know you know that young woman did not say that the, that the goal of god was his glory but our good in this case the common good a more humanistic flourishing if you will the now going on according according to the broader literature as in everything that they surveyed majority psychological humanistic etc the concept of flourishing entered the academic literature through the field of positive psychology positive psychology if you do your own research on positive psychology you'll find that it is a brainchild of the psychology that involves what self-actualization self-actualization the belief that people can perfect themselves the belief that people are not sinful the belief that in the and I've done this on my thesis on humanism self-actualization and its adjoining joining philosophies as joining as adjoining schools of thought believe that some men evolve develop self-actualize more than others and thus they are to well be more in charge anywho Corey Keyes, reading, reading the, the green, Corey Keyes' 2007 seminal work on flourishing begins with the premise that, put simply, the absence of mental illness is not the presence of mental health. So just because you're not ill doesn't mean you're healthy. Rather, think about that, just because you're not ill does not mean you're healthy. If you think about it, remember, during the pandemic, just because you had no symptoms doesn't mean you were in fact doesn't mean you weren't unhealthy doesn't mean that you weren't a danger rather a flourishing based understanding of mental health involves the presence of something positive what does that entail moreover mental health is not a zero-sum game as individuals well-being can fall anywhere on a continuum between flourishing and languishing remember a continuum kind of like a gender fluidity what it means to be masculine or feminine, a man or a woman. What it means to be anything, really, this continuum, this range, if you will. Multiple psychometrically validated instruments have been developed and employed for both research purposes and to assess individuals' position on this continuum. 
Think about those implications. Even though you're not mentally ill, other people can determine whether or not you are mentally healthy. And they have the tools, the psychometric tools that they developed to determine, to assess whether or not you are. Big data, artificial intelligence, automation, anyone, all these things will are being pulled to, together. This is not a separate thing. This is on the horizon. Rest in the green on the left, flourishing as an organizational concept has not yet migrated fully to research on schools. It's already begun. A number of these schools are already doing more of this research themselves and sharing it. Not just ACSI, but all of their partners. And by the way, they have, they have a lot in the big in the in the big world. While the instrument is is statistically predictive, predictive, it is not proscriptive. So it can predict what happens, but it can't tell you what to do. It can't tell you how. More accurately, it can't tell you how to do something. Rather, the results provide a rich picture of flourishing within Christian schools while identifying the elements of culture that are most strongly related to flourishing. Let's see. In the red on, on the right, furthermore, the community nature of schools, which are composed of multiple stakeholder groups. Bear in mind, that's just not those who are directly related within the inner or secondary circles of the students. That could tell governments and businesses as well. Necessitates that research on flourishing consider the, the viewpoints and perspectives of as many of those groups as possible rather than, than, than a small subset. Yielded, and by in mind, this research yielded a rich conceptual, according to them, yielded a rich conceptual basis for instrument development. This instrument measures who so who was surveyed, and the what refers to, remember, what they want, what they expect their outcomes to be, what they desire, where and when, this is important, despite their foundation on timeless principles of historical faith, schools in the U.S. and beyond are not impervious to influences arising from these contexts. These include market challenges brought about by a proliferation of school options and a changing faith profile of parents. So notice that. The changing faith profile of parents is a market challenge. Meaning that when people change what they believe, you have to change how you market to them. You have to change your product, your service, to receive customers. If I recall, when the churches start becoming more business oriented, well, then you end up with uh, what we have today. Used car salesmen and just utter charlatans behind the pulpit or working behind the scenes to benefit from so called nonprofit organizations, 501c3s. Educational challenges arising from rapid technological innovation, increasing student learning needs, and diversification of schools. So diversification of schools is an educational challenge. Keep that in mind. Social challenges, like shifts in family structure, changes in values and behavior norms, and in the red, rising secularism. That's a social challenge. Rising secularism says the people who based essentially 90% of their research on some of the most secular philosophy, theology, and just if not religion itself when conducting this research and implementing the implications that come from it. Certainly, these influences shape the experiences of students and other school constituents, which in turn shape school culture, from teaching methods to school policies to desired student outcomes. 
and most everything in between. So keep that in mind. Changing the changing markets, trying to sell things things to people. Diversification. That's racial, that's social economic, as well as spiritual, religious, philosophical. All of the above. And yet, in spite of that being a challenge, they argue here, as well as the Church of England and Cardis, schools need to be, especially private Christian schools, need to be more diverse. Because it's not about it's not about saving faith. It's about the common good. You'll see soon. You'll see soon. I'm not just putting words in their mouth. A dearth of research on Christian schools themselves means the literature does little to inform an understanding of why Christian schools do what they do. So bear in mind, this research does not give any information on how to do something, in this case, in a Christian, in a biblical sense, or why. So the meat of it is taken out. Top right, the outcomes that specify the effective school have been progressively narrowed and in many studies are reduced to test results of academic knowledge. These are important measures of schooling, but not the only outcome that matters. An excessive or exclusive focus on the cognitive is impoverished, the cognitive. And bear in mind when I mean cognitive, they mean emotional. Psychology and psychometrics, especially the positive psychology, is very much based on emotion, feelings. You'll see, you'll see hints of that throughout this. In the blue, Christian schools are concerned with academic outcomes, but they are also concerned with the development of whole student as one who is made in God's image, created to do his good works, Ephesians 2.10, and called to grow as his disciple. This necessitates a focus on holistic learning, Holistic learning, holistic in general, shoot, that's secular humanism, it's pluralistic, it's new agey, and if you think I'm being facetious, well, let's head on over to book of Ephesians 2.10, let's give a biblical comparison, if I can get this thing to open, I can't, <laughs> hold that thought, there you go. Nope, oh, wrong one. Whatever. My apologies. Alright, in the meantime, while that loads, I do have something else for you. I do have something else for you here. I think you'll enjoy this. So. I'm instead of waiting for the third episode where I introduced the book, I, it took me a while to find this, but this is a, I'm going to show you portions of this video focusing on the words of Rose Hudson Wilkin, who provided the foreword to that of Flourishing Together, co-authored by ACSI and the Church of England schools. Now, it says it's an address to Oak National Academy. When, <laughs> and the date said 2020. But in my mind, when I think of an address, especially this this kind of this kind of speech, I thought it was with this kind of speech. I thought it was literally going to be outside or inside, whatever. But for an audience, you know, she's behind a podium and you know, that kind of like that old school trying to be inspirational before a crowd type of deal. But no, it's 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 she did it during 2020, so anyways. This is this is this is who Rose Hudson is and she's brought and she's referenced quite a few times by ACSI and of course well her very own the Church of England. It probably doesn't feel like it to you but life can just fly by. Which makes the idea of flourishing even more important. Rose Hudson Wilkin is the Church of England Bishop. Sorry about that. 
do that again. It probably doesn't feel like it to you, but life can just fly by. Which makes the idea of flourishing even more important. Rose Hudson Wilkin is the Bishop of Dover and is the first black woman to become a Church of England Bishop. All right, so first comp, so aside from Rose Hudson Wilkin, which you just learned about her, yeah, yes, her, is it me or do these two women look almost the same and almost have the same voice? That's what happens when you have unnatural hair color that's unique, but not really because it's mainstream, like nobody's business, and you cake yourself. So women, if you want to stand out, especially to a God-fearing man that really wants to not live a superficial life, just be you. Because I literally, when I watched this, first time I watched Futile, I did not realize, I actually, like, subconsciously did not realize it was two different females. We're so privileged that Bishop Rose has agreed to speak to us today on the topic of flourishing. I am delighted to be with you for your assembly today. So yeah, it was, yeah, it's 2020, so it's pre-recorded. Yeah, that's... I was, I don't know, when you, when you, when you, when you read this speech, you can't help but imagine something a little more impressive than this situation. Anyways. In the story of creation, God looked at all that he had created, including humankind, and said, yes, meaning it is good. We're told that God made us one human race in his image, that he provided for us with a beautiful environment, the sea and everything in it, the different animals, the land with its trees and fruits and flowers, the natural resources all spread across the world. Yeah, so I hope you've caught quite a few of these things. Including the fact that God didn't say yes. Anyways. God wanted us all to flourish together. God wanted us just to take what we needed. Remember the words of the Lord's Prayer? Before she gets into that, okay, just as a reminder, this was done... 2020, so, and the book was published in 2021. In the first video I showed you, that was done in 2022. Remember, this, this woman, this female clergyman, is a, is, a, is a hefty inspiration and figurehead of flourishing. And remember, she's from across the pond. So, this isn't like this you know this isn't a loose thing this, this is a conjoint effort give us this day our daily bread god wants us just to take what we need for each day once again sounds true right sounds great a lot of what she's saying there's nothing that controversial about it until you see the contemporary application so that we can flourish together. See? And what does that entail? By the way, I'll be showing you the second part to this later. Like that, that, that really puts the icing on the cake. Sadly, us humans, we have been selfish. We have taken much more than we needed. And in order to do this, we have enslaved other human beings and animals. I had to I had to reread that part. I remember I I read all of this the first time in the book. We enslaved human beings and animals. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna keep going. Like when you actually hear it comes out of somebody's mouth, it's and this is supposed to be Christian like this is supposed to be like this, remember this is one this is ACSI, Cardis Cardis is off the side, they're not doing this directly, but they're still partnering with these people. This is ACSI Church of England also being partnered with, with like Cardis. This and this is 
This is a secondary, by the way. I mean, it's in the forward of the book for a reason. We have told some people that they are not good enough because of the color of their skins or because they are disabled. We created weapons of warfare and we have destroyed our environment. This is one of the reasons why millions of people are on the move leaving the countries they were born in to try and get to another place where they can prosper and flourish with their families. Yeah, a lot of this sounds great too, right? But as you notice, there's these speed bumps, these potholes, if not these, these pips and barbed wire blockades that come up every now and then. In our assembly today, I want us to learn that we should never think that because we have food and drink, because we have a lovely home, because we have good clothes or we can get good medicine, that all is well. Only when everyone flourishes will we all be truly doing well together. Some of you may be thinking to yourself, first, first thing, oh, that's communism. No, no, no. That's more extreme than, than communism. When you actually read the Communist Manifesto, amongst other writings, Karl Marx, up until the early 20th century, that is, they were not that idealistic. Like, this is a whole, this is, this is, this is a whole another level of collectivism. Anarchists don't, anarchists don't think this, communists don't think this, and the majority of socialists don't even think this. Like, this is... Yeah, I mean, both, I mean, remember, remember, remember the, remember, the Soviet Union began with the Bolshevist minority. They would, they would listen to this and think it was utter garbage. <laughs> As as extreme as they were, they would listen and like, no, that's just ridiculous. That's it's not doable. Imagine that. Imagine that. So yeah, this is. Anyways, we're gonna get back to that later. But let's see here, let's open that back up, and I'm gonna disappear again. So let's go to Ephesians two ten. So remember, this is about this is about what Christian schools are concerned with academic. So right on the, on the right, Christian schools are concerned with the academic outcomes, but they are also concerned with the development of the whole student as one who is made in God's image, created to do His good works, and called to, to grow as His disciple. This is, necessitates a focus on holistic learning. So let's read around that. Let's let's go let's go to Ephesians two ten. Let's start with verse eight through twelve. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Notice there's no talk about salvation. There's no talk about needing to be redeemed from your sins and become more like Christ in his righteousness. And that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. So by grace ye are saved through faith. So that's the kind of grace we're talking about. Being saved from our sins, not of ourselves, is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, so Gentiles in the flesh, so meaning, so meaning being a non-believer, living living a you know living a, you know a pre-christ pre-holy spirit filled life who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands who are called un un sorry uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands 
So those who circumcise themselves in the flesh. So bear in mind, this is, he's referring back to the Jews who were saying, well, you're not circumcised in the flesh. You're not following the Jewish ways. So thereby you're uncircumcised, thereby you, you like don't believe and you're just, you're just apostates, you're heretics, pretenders. That at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Commonwealth of Israel. So commonwealth meaning, and remember, Israel is what? The covenant with God. That's meant by the, by the commonwealth. It's community of, it's in covenant with God. Not, not following, not following ritual, purely following ritual and uh, ceremony, but in following a covenant of holiness, righteousness with God. And strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And let's go to verse 13, just to, just to uh, tie up with a nice little bowstring. Sorry, bowstring, my goodness. But now in Christ Jesus, I've been thinking about archery recently. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So, being called to be holy, set apart, following the righteousness of the Lord. Let's turn our attention over to the right and the green. The CARDIS Education Survey, CES, so remember CARDIS from Canada, which reports the outcomes of North American Christian and non and non-religious independent school sectors and compares them to that of public sector graduates, has led the way in broadening the understanding of Christian education's impact in multiple domains. So CARDIS did a lot of this research prior. Now the ACSI and Church of England are following suit. So you can thank our cousins in, you know, in, you know, in Canada. So if you want to know what direction the average private Christian school is going to go, just look at private Christian education in England, and that's the next step. And if you look at Canada, that's the next two steps. All right, so you see here, so this is a, a graph of the school's expected student outcomes, which fell into six major domains, spiritual, academic, community, excellence, impact, and servanthood. So this is a survey. So this is a survey. This, so these were the things that were surveyed from 15,000 plus respondents. Remember, it's just what, who, when, and where. There's no how, there's no why. It's just whatever people think, believe, or feel it is or should be done. So under spiritual, you got things like empowered by the Holy Spirit. So yeah, they did they you know they did a survey that involves you know how to be you know a survey where the expected outcome was students being empowered by the Holy Spirit. And, you know, you got things academic, pretty straight, more st standard, straightforward, reading, writing, speaking, math, science, history. But then you get to things more that are more abstract and not as concrete things you, you think you wouldn't be able to measure unless you're just asking for people's opinions. Wisdom, critical thinking, problem solving, lifelong learning. Research, I mean, they do research, they do research, I mean, it's... it's the problem solving, I say the problem solving is even ambiguous because, well, what kind of problems? And once again, how or why should they be solved? These are things that are not looked into. The, the why, the hows, and a lot of things are just, in essence, just not part of the equation because how can you be, especially when you're asking about people's feelings, their wants, their expectations, their, you'll, you'll see what I mean soon. Community. Relationships, partnerships, families, friendships, social civics. Remember, this is how you feel about these things. It's what you would hope for, what you want for people to whatever about them. 
Excellence, body as temple of Holy Spirit. Skill development these days, that means for what? Jobs. For, for big corporations, especially those subsidized by the government, especially during bailouts. Mark of Christian life. That's kind of weird. It says mark for Christian life. That's excellence, and yet over spiritually a visible fruit of the Spirit. I don't know why those two are I don't, so makes me so I know what visible fruit of spirit are but what the heck is mark of Christian life anyways impact impact the world for Christ and remember and these days that can mean anything change the world through the Holy Spirit same thing use gifts to influence the world same thing leadership and great commission it's like the great commission you would assume is make making disciples of of the of the nation but when you got all this other stuff including these first three you wonder what that really means servanthood serve serve christ serve others humility so yeah you can do psychometric data on how to measure humility apparently good stewardship of time talent and treasure willingness to work hard outreach activities serve family and community and once again I'm not saying these things on their own. Some of them, I, I'd say, just throw out are irrelevant, if not problem. But once again, what's what's the underlying how and why? Research design. The FSCI was constructed as an exploratory instrument to develop a predictive model of Christian school flourishing. A key assumption of the researchers, remember, a key assumption of the researchers was that the complexity of the research myth methodology should roughly match the complexity of the phenomenon under investigation by Swainer, 2016. Thus, because of the complexity of inputs within the school's ecosystem, ecosystem, bear in mind in, in the book Flourishing Together, amongst other things that you'll be seeing, there's this constant presence of comparing people to the rest of creation. And we are created beings, but the Lord has set us apart from creation, yet we're measurable like creation. And plus, here's another thing too, ecology is a pseudoscience. I'll be doing a video on that in the future as well. It is, it is so based, it's, it, it is a biological science based on assumptions and just poor sample size research. It's not even funny. Instrument development was both extensive and rigorous. Thus, because the complexity of inputs within the school system, instrument development was both extensive and rigorous. I don't even care when people say something's rigorous anymore. It's it's so it's so vapid now. It's it's a, it's just it's it's just a marketing tool. Sampling and administration. The FSCI fielded bet between fall 2018 and early spring 2019. As a reminder of the time frame. Only students in 6th through 12th grade participated in the student survey. So remember, they surveyed all these people during this time under the assumption that they knew how complex it was. Speaking of which, here's, a, here's something that I found interesting that they never really discussed in this. Now, if you look very carefully at this chart, You'll notice that you have about a little over 7,000 students, a little, a little over 4,000 parents, about 1,300 alumni, 1,300 teachers, 226 administrators, including, which includes 65 heads of school, 413 support staff, and 216 board members. Now, if you look at the percent, if you look to the far right on the percent of, of color, I love that. Percent of color. Well, for one, there's nothing collected about the students. I mean, in fact, you don't even know if the students, they didn't even bother to survey if the students were male or female. The justification for, for that later is because they didn't want, they didn't want confusion with demographics, which is funny because they counted, they recorded the demographic information of non-students, which make up the majority of those who took the survey. So I don't understand why that's it's that anyways. But the largest grouping of people of color 
is are the parents at almost one out of five. So almost one out of five parents that did the survey were not white, because we all know what that means, of color, not white, not European, not fair-skinned, for the most part. Go with just not white slash European. It's weird, like, you know, because even these days, a lot of people who aren't European count as white, so I don't, I don't know anymore. Anyways. Anyways, let's see here. And it just gets smaller and smaller for the, for the most part, right? So, and then it hovers around 1 out of 10 on average after that. So it goes from it goes from 1 out of 5 to about 1 out of 10 on, with the rest of the groups. But that's not the important part. The important part is to look over when you compare the female versus the male demographic. Among the parents, it's 72% of the parents were female, 59% of the, the alumni, so remember these are people surveyed, were female, 77% of the teachers surveyed were female. Remember, this is 6th through 12th grade. Arguably secondary level. Junior high and high school. Leaders, administrators, 59% were female. But if you look at school heads, it's 37. So even though the majority of leaders, administrators are female, only about one out of three heads of school are female. And then you have support staff, 91%, board members, 37. So interesting. I find that interesting. So those, so, 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 so the majority of the high executives and those working behind the scenes operating the school are, the majority, about two out of three are male. And then the vast majority of the rest, the people including parents and alumni involved in this were female. Especially that those two large numbers, the, the teachers and the parents. So my point is this, what? This is a lopsidedly female perspective. Remember, this is psychometrics. These are measuring female, these are, these, these are measuring people's selections of feelings, expectations, you know, their sense of what should be the outcome of schooling, of Christian schooling in part, of, from these schools in, in particular. And bear in mind, 15,000 responses is actually a fairly large data set when it's all said and done. Oh, and there's just a little fun fact looking at this chart. At the high school that I went to, the private high school that I went to, it would actually be combined with the junior high, it would be in the 36th percentile. It was between the 201 and 400. I graduated from, from a class of 63, including myself. But then also I found really interesting too is uh, the rather disproportionate responses, you know, reception of responses across the board when you look, look on, on the right. 16% from California, that's to be expected. There's tons of ACI, ACSI-associated schools there. I thought it was pretty odd that when you look at the the area attached to Arizona in the light, in the light orange, is only 3%, but what surprised me more was over next door in the dark gray with Texas, and that area is only 6%. Because there are, there are plenty of ACSI associate schools in those six states, especially between Texas, Oklahoma, Texas, Oklahoma alone have quite a few ACSI associated schools. So yeah, a little, so yeah, so the demographics far as, far as, you know, or state of origin is uh, interesting in itself. Especially when you notice a large percentage are from along the coastal areas, but you could say there's more people, but remember, there's still a fair number of schools within the interior of the country as well. Anywho, construct analysis. Let's make sure I'm checking time. Good, lovely. We're actually doing really well, believe it or not. The data w was approached without a preconceived theoretical framework to be validated. That's nonsense because you approach this measuring flourishing, <laughs> your definition of flourishing. So 
So without a preconceived theoretical framework to, to, be, uh, to, to be validated. No, there are actually quite a few assumptions, including the mindset of flourishing. Anyways, instead, the data was allowed to speak for itself. Sure it was. The constructs being identified are often referred to as latent constructs, which means simply that they are concepts that cannot be measured directly. You hear that? They can't be measured directly. Well, of course they can't. It's, like I said, it's human feelings, by the way. Anyways, the valid approach to measuring latent constructs is to evaluate a range of prompts that group together naturally, addressing an underlying idea from more than one frame. Addressing an underlying idea, which includes flourishing amongst other things. By the way, I'll leave this. I'll leave a link below. You can also go to the ACSI website as well and download this. Everything I get is, everything I show you, everything I get is essentially free and ready to be downloaded. Can doesn't need to be bought. The information is out there, people. None of this is secret. None of this has to be hidden. Oh, I'm to tell you. So on the right, predictive predictive modeling. In terms of linkages between these constructs and outcomes, the initial predictions detectable were identified using structural equation modeling. SEM, and logistic regression techniques. It's a lot, bear with me. These techniques enable the model to be used to predict changes in desired outcomes. These techniques enable the model to be used to predict changes in desired outcomes if or when changes are made related to underlying latent constructs. The outcome initially revealed by the model should not be confused with correlation relationships, which have no power what with these people and using power to predict future outcomes? Remember, on the left, the data was approached without a preconceived theoretical framework to be validated. But remember, it's based on Flourish, their idea, this notion, this educational philosophy of flourishing, and it's supposed to be predictive. Anywho, let's go to the, down to red. The finalized Flourishing School Culture and Instrument, FSCI, is no longer exploratory in nature, but now predictive measure of school flourishing. Data from the FSCI will be used to generate school-level reports that provide insights into school strengths as well as areas schools can target via improvement initiatives and processes. This is how science is done these days, people. Remember, two big things about science. But you're not going to see it in science in general, especially social science. Observation and repeatability. How much is this based on observation? Not much. And have they repeated this? No. No, they haven't actually. It's like, and yet it's been, and yet it has the power to be a predictive program, a predictive model. Second, a predictive model of school flourishing was developed from the final number of validated constructs for each group. These constructs were mapped. Remember, the constructs are, are all the you know, different things I've shown you on the other charts. These constructs were mapped onto the first ever research... Notice, these constructs were mapped onto the first ever research-based model of Christian school flourishing, the Flourishing School Culture Model, FSCM. It's the first ever... This has not been repeated, but it has the power to accurately predict. Remember, people, follow the science. And there's a bunch of other stuff here, too. I don't really understand it, slash. I don't really understand it too well, slash, the parts I do understand. In a nutshell, it's basically... Well, basically, the key thing is this. If you look on the left, number of items... And you look on the right, the final number of validated constructs. So as you see, when you, when, you, when you do the math, it's basically the number of items. So the initial constructs they start off with trying to measure. Not directly, by the way. We got narrowed down to about a third. So about a third of the validated constructs remain. And what they mean by validated constructs in the long term, what I do understand is the fact that it's that of which showed statistical significance, meaning that there was a notice, there's a there's a noticeable ch change in the calculations versus versus the other two thirds of the things 
it didn't really even change change the scale so there's that defining purpose so let's look over the five key things which are purpose relationships well-being expertise and resources and learning orientation very strange term indeed but first but first before we read through this let's go to the book of john there's there are two there are two key verses parts of verses parts of verses when ACSI does something really interesting I've not seen done in, well, just so nonchalantly, or perhaps I just need to get out more and read more nonsense. Anyways, is the use of parts of verses. So they're basing, they're trying, they're, 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 they're arguing we have a biblical foundation but it's based on parts of verse, not verse, not passages, not verses, but parts of verses. So in this case, you have John 10, 10, B. So let's see what I mean by 10, 10, B. So, well, let's see here. Let me highlight this. Let me highlight this real quick. So this is 10, 10, B. So they so and this is and you can watch the video, read the book, whatever. Lynn Lynn Swanner refers to, to to these verses quite often. Ten ten b, she cites, "I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly." Now in the translation she uses, it says, "and that they might have it in an you know, in their you know, in you know, in its fullness." fullness versus abundantly but what is left out when you focus on 10 10 B let's look at a the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy colon which means this means what I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly I want you to think about that. The first part of verse is making it very clear that there's a thief. There's someone who's coming to steal, to kill, and to, to, and to destroy. That of the sheep. Those are the followers of Christ. By the, by the way, the followers of Christ. But Christ says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Not in its fullness, but abundantly. So I find that quite something where you leave out that there's an enemy afoot that we need to be wary of. And you're talking about fullness instead of life in its fullness versus abundance. Well, let's, well, if you read around it, once again, read around it. Let's start with verse, let's start with verse, let's see here. Let's, let's, no, let's start with verse eight. We're gonna read to, to, to verse 12. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. All that ever came before me, this is Christ, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go out, in and out, and find pasture. Pasture, excuse me. The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. Interesting now, isn't it? Now, why would she leave out that first half of the verse? And also the strong coincidence that her partner, her co-author from Church of England schools is named Andy Wolf. I'm not insinuating anything. I will do that more in part two and definitely in part three. But for now, we're just gonna assume 
no spoilers intended, right? That it's just a coincidence. Always, that's the thing, people's names. You always wonder if it's, if there's something to a name. Although I know a fair number of people whose names are Christian and Lord knows that they are Antichrist. And they are proud of that. Let's go to John 15, 5. Once again, B. <laughs> Once again, B. That's the verse that's referenced, John 15, 5, B. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. What's interesting is the fact that this is in reference to interdependence, which for some reason is reference, is reference to other people, and being interdependent with other people. But when you put the whole verse in, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Thereby he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. So you can base a worldview, a philosophy of interdependence on this verse. In fact, once again, let's read around it. Starting with verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me... He is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Interesting, right? When you read the Bible in its entirety, when you read scripture as a whole, you start to notice that certain things are seemingly being purposefully left out. Alright, what? I'm gonna go ahead and see here. Let's take a quick pause. See what I mean? Look, okay, I'm not being, okay, tell me if I'm being superficial or not or being paranoid, but look, here's this woman, right? How much different does she look than this woman? Now you can argue, oh, their highlights are different. Okay, really? That may be true. But it's unnatural hair color, which means either of them could literally just change their hair to that other person's hair the very next day. Yeah, I'm sorry. Ladies, you need to just, you just need to revel in the natural beauty that the Lord has given you. That is what men are looking for. And plus, here's the thing. If your thing is, like, well, I, it's not about attracting men. It's not being, about being attracted to men. No, you, no. If you, if you really are confident, if you really do, are comfortable in your own skin, you, you only need your natural everything. 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 Clean it, groom it, dress modestly, decently take care of yourself you'll be fine individually before the Lord and you will attract men who are interested in you and not in a false image anywho so before we go on to so before we go on to the five constructs that were, you know, as listed over here in the window. Sorry about that. Just boom, boom, boom. Before we go over here, purpose, relationships, well-being, expertise, resources, and learning orientation. Let's look at some further context on what those entail in the grand scheme of things. Let's let's look at the second half of Rose Hud's Wills. I'm not gonna call her I'm not gonna give her her, her title. 
Let's go look at Miss Rose Hud, you know, Hudson Wilkins' address. So as we grow up, let us remember that we belong together, all who are made in God's image. We don't just get to choose the people who look like us or speak like us or the ones we like. There is a Zulu word called Ubuntu. Zulus. I've been actually reading a, a fairly large book, amongst other things, about the Zulus. Yeah, these are not, that is, they are not a people that you use as an example for peaceful coexistence. It means, I am, because you are. Whatever I want you to be, if I happen to be in charge, and if you don't, you will be killed on the spot. Amongst other things. Now seriously, go, like, go, like... Go find a book, an article, something that's written before 2000. Yeah. You, you don't reference the Zulus as an example of inclusion. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah, they, they, I mean, you're included. But it's more like a gang. Anywho. In other words, we are a people together. We are interdependent. Yeah, you're, you're interdependent because once again, if you don't toe the line, if you don't do what you're told, a number of terrible things can happen to you and, and, your, and your family. We do not exist by ourselves. No one really flourishes unless we flourish together yeah like i said if, if this is this is more extreme than than like communism black and white young and old rich and poor able-bodied and disabled we are all god's children we are all god's children that's everybody made in the image of god Christian and non-Christian, follower of Christ, not follower of Christ. From atheist to Zoroastrian. Mystery Babylon people. Tower of Babel, 21st century. We will flourish, not on our own, but we will flourish when we are all together. And that's a wonderful message to remember and to think about as we go forward daily living our lives. I am because you are. Yeah, and notice I am. I am because you are. Just gonna say, that's um, towing the line of blasphemy. I mean, no, notice what she, you may think, oh, that's a stretch. No, no. Notice what she said so far. Especially when anybody is a child of God. Except God doesn't say that. In fact, uh, God says that everybody's born his enemy. In their sin, in their rebellion against him. Anywho. Together we will flourish. We'll come back to this soon. Actually, no, no. So yeah, this is over, right? So listen to, to look at that. Nothing's impossible because you are unstoppable. By the way, that's not talking about God. That's talking about people who happen to follow God, but still people. So yeah, they all give a final address, you know, there's a prayer being made and whatnot, so it's, you know, it's pretty, it's not, it's, just, it's actually way less sacrilegious than, than what that woman said by a long shot. But more importantly, remember the irony of this, this is done during 2020, and the song emphasizes how people are, are unstoppable.
Nothing's impossible because you are unstoppable. Except, well, Germ stopped the whole entire world and convinced the vast majority of the population that life wasn't worth risking or even living. And they're all doing this remotely by themselves from a camera. But yeah, nothing's impossible because all these people here are unstoppable. All right, that was just my little tidbit there. Just 2020, my goodness. And for a lot of places into 21 and early 22. Yeah. You are never going to convince me after 2020 that mankind is going to prosper on their own merit. Anyways. All right, defining purpose. John Hole, 2003, identifies Christian perspective as the defining concept in Christian education or that which fundamentally makes Christian education distinctive from other forms of schooling. Bear in mind, there is nothing that says what Christian perspective is or how it's to be exercised or why. It's just the defining concept in Christian education that makes it distinctive from everybody else. But so far, from what we've read, from what we've listened to, or what we've witnessed, how true is that? Eh, there's subtle differences, but not quite. All right, so under purpose, the purpose constructs are responsibility. Leaders, teachers, and support staff feel a sense of shared ownership ownership for school mission success and improvement so feel sense of shared ownership so emotions and e economics because after all bear in mind we live we live in a post capitalist post communist world it's basically a unity but unity between the two combined with technocracy transhumanism and, proselytiz and proselytization through education yeah so you got carnality and mammon all rolled into one all right holistic teaching teaching involves helping students develop spiritually and emotionally teaching the heart and soul as well as the mind so teaching involves helping students develop spiritually and emotionally. Teaching the heart and soul as well as the mind. So the mind is secondary. It's an afterthought. That's, that's what holistic teaching is. It's, it's based on psychological paradigms. In this case, more, more particularly positive psychology, brainchild, bastard child of self-actualization. Integrated worldview. Christian worldview changes how we educate. There is no such thing as a secular sphere. Except the problem is, when they say that, there's no such thing as a secular sphere, I don't think they're talking about, once again, I don't think that they're talking about what, 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 what we really mean. Because I've heard a lot of things, you know, well, God, you know, God reigns and rules over everything. And he has his hands in everything, so thereby nothing secular. Like, yeah, except everything you do is humanistic at its core. So what's so I don't so I don't think when you mean there's no such thing as a secular sphere that you mean to actually have the Lord, have Jesus Christ, be sovereign in that area. Anywho, God's story. Students believe they are a part of God's bigger plan and can be used by him to, does this sound different than everybody else? Make a difference. Like I said, we live in a world of platitudes. Make a difference. How long has that been preached, preached in, and taught in the wider world? Across, you know, across different realms and spheres, including in government and big business. Or just business in general. Anywho, questioning. Students have doubts 
So I labeled these bread because, come on, students have doubts about their faith, lack time to pray or study the Bible, and feel that most Christians are too judgmental. Fun fact, the reason why this isn't red is because this isn't just a, you know, people do experience this. Which is a fair observation. Except, no, this is valid. It's okay if they doubt. It's okay if they, don't, if they feel like they don't have time to, to study the Bible and, and that most Christians are too judge, you know, judge, you know, mental. It, that's, that's okay. Except Jesus said, didn't, said not to doubt. Jesus said to Jesus and God, like, Jesus, God, the Father, Holy Spirit, you know, the whole gambit, unanimously, on, in one concord, in perfect unity, unlike us, that's why I don't, I don't believe in believe in you know the unity of the unity of of like you know humanity because those those two words alone are too much up for a debate. If not, if not, if not a if not the definitions are made by those who are basically drunk out of their mind, metaphorically if not literally speaking. Anywho, but yeah, no, this is basically legitimizing, you know. Agnosticism, de you know, deconstructionism, being experimental, practicing syncretism, essentially. Anyways, partnership. Parents feel they are part of the school's mission, and that their children's spiritual development requires their partnering with and being involved at the school. So they feel... So they feel they're part of school's mission and that their children's child's spiritual development requires their partnering with and being involved at the school. So this is just a matter of, simple matter of, oh, I can just leave my kids at the school. You know, instead of having the adjunct, I can just leave my kids at the school and then not, and then ignore them. No, no, no. And then, no, no, instead I should take responsibility. And that's not, not, that's not what's being argued here and you'll see that in the book as well, well as other things. In that, no, no. I don't know. They feel that their child's spiritual development requires their partnering, so it means they need the school. Remember, this is a collectivist, interdependent ideology, theology. You need the teachers, you need the administrators, you need the resources, you need what the school is offering. You can't, you can't, basically this is arguing in subtle fashion against homeschooling. You as a parent are completely incapable of providing of providing for and nourishing your child's spiritual, you know, de you know, development and have and and instilling a mission, a life mission to follow, to serve, and be courageous in the things of the Lord God. Can't be done. You, you need the school, just like they tell parents in the public sphere. What it's you need the public school. Spiritual formation. Alumni report that their Christian faith is stronger than thanks to attending a Christian school, and they believe people can change with God's help. They believe people can change with God's help. I put that in green because that's also very ambiguous, and the application is all over the place and not necessarily biblical. And then there's relationships. For Christian schools, in particular, relationships are important because of the incarnational nature of, of, of the Christian faith, of Christian faith expressed through community and in discipleship. Let's go to John 1.14. Let's go sit back up. Oh, shoot, I think I went too far. <laughs> Let's go to John 1.14. As laid out, let's see what this says. Oh, goodness. Yeah, I went too far. My apologies. I will figure out a better system of how to do this. Meantime, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. We'll be ending pretty shortly, actually. Believe it or not. I'm getting better at the, cutting this down. <laughs> yeah, two around two and a half hours plus is way too long. We're going to be... Sh and I appreciate those. So I understand if... And I'm and I'm small fry. I'm small fish. And like I said before, if ever comes, to, if ever comes to a time where you find me just boring and effective, or you've outgrown me completely, well then more power to you. The Lord, 
Lord guide you, Spirit comfort you. To me, you just lead may may the Lord Jesus Christ just lead your steps. But don't just walk away because way you know, way because I'm asking because you because you you think I'm asking you to, to like to like you know to like you know, do too uh, too much because I don't even believe I'm doing enough. But that's why we read the word. Excuse me. So John one fourteen, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, let's read from 6 through 14. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. Remember, this is all about relationships, right? The world was, you know, the world, sorry, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we, be, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the, of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The translation that they use is not even close to this kind of reverence. But let's look at the rest of it. Let's, let's go up to verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness to the light that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the, the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So notice, not every person, as Rose pointed out, is a son of God, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. We'll go to Ephesians 4.16 later on, but for now, give some context here. How does that match up with these relationship constructs? Supportive leadership. Principals are trusted teachers. Feel that leaders have our backs, and leaders empower teachers and staff to make decisions. I'm sorry, that second part, if you're not letting teachers and staff make decisions, especially during very miscellaneous situations, then you're not running anything. So once again, feelings, right? Feel that leaders have our backs. Feel. As long as you feel, so feel you'll know, feel that way, you're good. It's good. We can move on. Leadership interdependence. Diverse backgrounds, transparency about one's weaknesses, and relying on others to offset those weaknesses is key. Fun fact, the transparency thing is very much Roman Catholic, particularly Jesuit in origin. It's certainly older than that, come from other, others, but it's heavily influenced by it. Part three, I'll sh share a few arenas that will make that more clear. So diverse backgrounds. Sadly, it's, sadly, it's never, it's never, it's never just what you think it is or what they claim it is. And they got parent relationships. Teachers get to know parents, and frequent and, sy and systemic communication facilitates positive relationships. I left this blank because, yes, if you had only some parents you can do this, but me, this is my fourth year and my last, being a private full-time teacher, as far as I'm concerned, unless, like I said, the school makes a grand revolutionary change, but that will be a miracle in itself, the way the world at large is going. Anywho, but being a teacher for for fourth year full-time, even, even when the school was smaller, that was at least 25 groups of parents. Frequently and systematically communicating with 25 sets of parents, especially when there were split households. Yeah, it's, it's just not doable. It's not quality. It's machine learning at best. It's, it's Yeah, but I mean, it was a handful of parents, sure, but even in a small private school setting of 25 sets of parents, it's... Yeah, it's, I mean, you could have relationships with some of them, but as a whole, no. Community engagement. 
The school engages with the surrounding community and regularly taps into community resources, including networking and resource sharing with other schools. And regularly taps into community resources. Fun fact. Not just in, not just in this publication, but actually in a public of flourishing schools, but as well as in a publication that was actually done the following last year, following year last year in 2022. It shows examples of non-Christian, if not anti-Christ institutions that you tap into as a community resource. Ha ha, there you go. How do you, how do you uh, minister in the world? You link arms with the world and you do as, what other people are doing. All right, mentoring students. Staff points out talent in each student. Helps students see how they fit in God's bigger plan. Sadly, that includes doing whatever else doing, college, career, yeah, yeah, yada. And are aware of students' struggles at school or home. I'm glad they just asked for aware because, I mean, that's not really asking for a lot, but same with not if they mean aware to where you factor into all your decisions. No, that's just not realistic either. All right, insular culture. The school shields students from the world's brokenness. I'm going to, oh, fun fact, I'm going to have a podcast pretty soon. It's going to be more focusing more, it's going to be focusing more on the, more on the, what I'll be, on the, on the development, the offerings of my future online courses given to that of secondary students. I'll be addressing this in particular. The theology of brokenness. It is broke back. That's all I gotta say. All right, the school is independent from the surrounding community. Remember, everybody's gotta be interdependent. We all gotta become one world, one humanity. How dare you be independent? So it, does, so it doesn't matter even if you're serving the community, if you're if you're ministering to the community. No, 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 you can't be have this mindset of independence, or you can't even be can't even be functionally independent from the surrounding community. Oh. And or the student lacks diversity. Student body lacks diversity, yeah. Because when I go teach at a school, when, as an educator, I teach at a school, I, what I really look forward to is teaching people who don't look like me, who don't act like me, who don't believe like me, and it, it, it goes deep. They always say, oh, it's, it's, just, it's just race and social economics. No, it, it's, that's what, that's what ACSI is promoting. Differences in race, socioeconomics, and ability, but then once again, you take a step further with, with the Church of England schools. Oh, gender diversity, sexual diversity, as they call it. And if you take it two steps ahead with Cardis with Canada, well then yeah, you can just you can you can be you can be a house plant. Anyways, Christ like teachers. Teachers show Christ like love, kindness, and care to students. Students are cared about individually, including their spiritual development. Generally speaking, yeah, why not? Okay, but of course it's hard to do all that when you gotta do all this other nonsense, including pro-social orientation. Students not only enjoy helping others, but are also, also are known by others, as in their peers, for showing love and care. Pro-social orientation. By the way, that's in green because you know what that could lean into? Well, Remember, this is from a psychological paradigm. And this is in relation to studies conducted by people who base their research on Lev Vygotsky, who used similar language and paradigms, psychological paradigms at that, Lev Vygotsky, a Marxist, Jewish, hyper-materialistic, like just, I mean, loyal, pro-Soviet, psychological researcher and, and a professor in the early Soviet Union. And really, if you have the mindset of not conforming to the will of the population at large and that of the government, you were, you were egotistical, you were antisocial. Anyways, but more on that in part two, especially part three. Caring environment. From the perspective of school graduates, teachers were kind, students felt included in class, and students were protected from bullying. 
students felt included in class. Whatever that means. Whatever that means. It, it, it could just be just pandering for all we know. And yeah, that's, 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 you know, that's fine. All right, learning and orientation. Adopting a learning or, or, you know, orientation. Found a growth-oriented faculty culture marked by teachers' views of vocation as including career law and professional growth at the core, linked with teachers' orientation towards professional learning, including motivation, so a motivational speaker, being motivated, motivating other people, and this, you know, that self-help, motivational speaker type of mindset, openness to new experiences, because how dare you just say that it's biblical or not, or you question the validity of it. I mean, it's, I mean, follow the science, follow the trends, follow whatever, follow the best practices. When you hear best practices, that means do what you're told or else you are not professional and you're not qualified. Level of interest in PD, professional development, that's a part of it. And sense of self-efficacy. Very prominent psychological paradigm. All right, for sake of time, feedback, collaboration. Yeah, it works pretty well, especially in small groups and you know the people and you trust them and you are like are like-minded. Systems thinking. When planning for change, the potential impact on the school, the classroom, and students, the overall systems are considered. Systems thinking. Big picture, data-driven. Data-driven. Follow the science. Oh, by the way, data-driven improvement. Data is used to gauge school results and effectiveness, determine goal attainment, and address problems the school faces. Professional development. PD is provided on site and is subject and role specific. Fun fact about PD in general, half of it is useless and the other half you could have done on your own or with a small group of people and gotten much more substance in less time. Anywho, outcomes focus. A strong belief is held that process doesn't matter if it isn't producing results and change is distracting if it doesn't lead to an increase in student achievement. Now, bear in mind, you may be saying, well, what's wrong with that? Remember, this is data-driven. It's from best practices. It's follow the science. That means you, that means, remember, teachers on the ground, educators on the ground, it doesn't matter what you know and what you do that works. You have to follow the impersonal, emotionally, mathematically you know social science driven paradigm part of the borg people part of the borg all right culture of improvement guided by school leadership and focused on the future the school is continually improving making makes necessary changes to improve so it's just change 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 it's prog it's focus on the future culture improvement fo fo focus on the future that's just another way of expressing progressivism change 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 it's this ongoing revolution I sound hyperbolic more on part two and definitely part three individualized instruction students are helped to figure out how they learn best and to identify their natural strengths and plus if you worked at any school especially a public school you'll know first firsthand that this yeah culture improvement yeah it's just constant whatever individualized instruction students are helped to figure out how they learn best and to identify their natural strengths once again which is okay but when you're working with a group of 10 to 15 multiple classes yeah somebody's got to take some more initiative other than the teacher providing instruction if that's to really take place but that's the thing we're not Critical thinking, by the way, does not involve and problem solving. Does not involve the way that the way that's the way that's truly designed is not does not involve people learning how to learn themselves. Hence the interdependence on the social structure. Defining expertise and resources. Now this one to me is the funniest because it's just obvious. Okay, found through research that unsurprisingly, see? Unsurprisingly. Barriers to school improvement inclu included a lack of qualified principals and teachers. Conversely, effective classrooms featuring effective instruction have been c consistently correlated with greater student achievement. So yes, yeah, so the people who are educating people are terrible and 
then the students aren't going to be terrible because they're being taught terribly. But anyways, but notice the solutions here. So what's the so 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 what should be done? Best practice orientation. Keeping up with best practices in teaching is prioritized and resources for doing so can be identified. This is literally what the public school does and this is why that they're garbage. Sorry, and I'm literally witnessing and experiencing this myself at my own school, not to as high of a degree, but I can only imagine, I can only imagine what public education is going through. Because what we're doing right now is ridiculous. Okay. It's been slowed down significantly, thank God, partly due to me saying a few things amongst others. But like I said, I can only imagine where, where there's no breaks. Okay, engage learning. Students engage in activities that nurture critical thinking, evaluating information and problem solving. Here's the thing. How do you do those three things, even if it, with any kind of quality, if you don't know what things are? If you don't know who's who, what they did, when they did it, where they did it, how they did it, or why they did it, these three things are useless. Just saying. So it's education that's done backwards. Classroom management. The classroom is orderly and teachers are organized and consistent with discipline. Yeah, it's really helpful, especially when uh, you know what actually works instead of following, following policies and procedures that are especially based on psychological paradigms that don't quite uh, get through a number of people, especially people who understand the psychological paradigms. Anywho, responsiveness to special needs. Teaching staff works together to serve students with special needs, aided by processes for identifying and responding to those needs. Once again, there's no issue with that, but when you try to integrate people with quote-unquote special needs, and literally, I mean, the, the range is ridiculously wide. Into the general population. Yeah, it's... It, other schools are doing... I've seen, seen other schools doing a greater you know, degree and it is fortunate to witness. All right, qualified staff. Now, this is the worst one. What do we mean by qualified staff? New teacher hires are credentialed educationally and licensed, certified, and have classroom experience. See, see, that last one, classroom experience, that's great, but most people, when they start teaching, like me, don't have quote-unquote classroom experience. You know what I'm saying? So, so, and the reason why we don't have classroom experience is because we're either a not willing to go through the credentialing or licensing pro, you know, process, or we can't, or we're not available. You know, yada yada yada. And to top it off, when they say classroom experience, they mean a particular kind of classroom experience, especially one that is licensed, certified, especially by the state. I leave it at that. Resources, materials, and resources for teaching, including technology, are sufficient. Realistically speaking, you don't need a lot of technology. It's 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 just a part of the craze. It's just a part of the just a part of the technocratic you know matrix. And the school building is in good physical con, you know condition, of course, because you don't want electrocuting or falling on you any, 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 any time soon. Resource planning and resource con, you know constraints. You know you you gonna you're basically good with your money. You're good with your resources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's pretty simple, simple straightforward. Well-being. Look how short and simple to the point well-being is. Teacher stress ultimately affects student outcomes. Found through their research that teachers with a profile of high stress, high burnout, and low coping were associated with the weakest student outcomes. And that applies according to, to, to the survey, one out of four educators in the schools that were surveyed. And it's not and it's in a nutshell, these three constructs. Stress. So what does well-being entail? Stress. Constant feelings of stress. And being overwhelmed with company a lack of time to, to prepare for instruction for teachers or to focus on physical health for, for leaders. So notice to here, a lack of time to prepare for instruction for teachers. And yet, uh, so far from what I've read, does it sound like teachers have a lot of time to prepare for instruction? Of course not. That's never the case. Okay. Now, my school, thank God, for the most part, it is. They, they, I will give them, I thank God that they don't micromanage me. Healthy living. 
students are happy with their physical health. Happy with their physical health. That means they perceive that their physical health is fine. It's not whether or not they're actually healthy. They think their health is fine. Including sufficient exercise and healthy diet. Resilience. And this is a big, this is a big concept right here. Psychological concept right here that's off the wall at times. Students handle stress effectively and respond well to bounce back from difficult situations. Which is own wording, fine, but... The big picture of this, yeah, it gets ridiculous. But think about it. Well-being. You're not stressed. You f you're you happy with your physical health. You know, so this, you see some linkages to the whole fat acceptance thing. Just saying. I mean, you're happy with your health. Come on now. A lot of people who aren't healthy are happy with their health. And resilient. So you're not stressed out. Well, you don't feel stressed out. So you don't feel stressed out. You're happy with your health and you can bounce back from difficult situations. That's well-being. Yep, that's it. Case closed, all right. So, last few quotes here. The FSCI is unique because of, the, of its unprecedented size, scope, and statistical power. We live, we live in a, we, we, you know, we, we, you know, we live in a world, a culture, a society, that's governed by, not by law, not by right, but by might and power. Everybody communicates in some shape or form. The FSCI was constructed around the idea that schools are cultures. The, the, the statistical power behind the FSCI allowed for the development of a finalized predictive measure of things that cannot be directly measured, by the way, that's social science for you, along with pre with a predictive model. Remember, this was this was done before the models that influenced, if not directed, public policy and emergency and mandates during the pandemic episodes in 2020. This helps schools to know where to invest limited resources in strategic efforts in order to have the greatest probability of achieving the goal of school improvement. Notice the math here. Notice the, the, the statistical mathematical terms here. It's data-driven. This is what data-driven is. And look here. Uh, rigorous hiring standards were measured by higher student math scores. So if a teacher knows math and can teach math, people do well in math. Go figure. And board reports that schools have adequate resources, higher overall test scores. So yeah, you have the stuff to take tests with, to study and take tests with. Good for you. Okay, school is responsive to special needs of students. Students have higher reading scores. Look at that, 1.6. When you really think about it, 1.6 is marginal. That means 60% more likely. Students report being physically healthy. Higher overall test scores, 1.3. Yeah. Amongst other things, too, it's... Oh, look, and listen to this one. None of these three inputs, community engagement, meeting learning needs, and teacher's best practices orientation would be traditionally thought of as levers to improve levers to improve spiritual outcomes of Christian school students, but FSCI research shows otherwise. Well, of course they wouldn't be, because engaging with community, what well, depends on what that means, meeting learning needs, depends on what that means, and definitely this one, teacher's best practice orientation, so when you're learning garbage. I've listened to some nonsense. I mean, imagine this, let me give you an example. Example, the last professional development that we had the representative from Grand Canyon University told one of our teachers that it doesn't matter, and he's teaching Bible, by the way, and she told him, it doesn't matter if they don't know who said or did what in the story, as long as they can apply the lessons of the story to their lives. I want you to think about that. And the, in this case, it was 
It doesn't matter if you know whether or not Abraham or Jacob, his grandson, said this or did this. As long as you apply the lessons to people's to to like to like to their lives. But here's my thing: if you can't even remember, if you can't even get into your head who did or said what in a story. What do you actually know or understand of the lesson in the story? <laughs> if you don't know the, like I said, it's learning backwards. If you don't know the fundamental facts about a story, about anything, how do you apply it accurately? <laughs> to... I'll leave it at that. All right. I mean, stuff like that. And, that. and that was not even the... That was far from even the most inane thing I've, that we were told. All right. It is possible that these inputs... It is also possible that these inputs... Oh, by the way, it is also possible that these... Okay, let me read the whole thing. It is, also, it is possible... Top right. Top left. Sorry. Top left. It is possible that these inputs... So what they put into the model, what they put into what the data that they that they interpreted, that these inputs have a significant positive effect on school culture. It is also possible that these inputs demonstrate biblical principles in action for students. Future work with the FSCI will, that will explore these possibilities future. Further, sorry, further. So it's possible, it's possible, it's possible. But remember, it's predictive. These are all just possibilities, not even reasonable possibilities, but these are just possibilities, but it's predictive model. FSCI data shows that teachers are more likely to stay at school if they are able to help students to learn at deeper levels. And by deeper, they mean, they mean, you know, being a, being a, being a, being a conformist zombie for the rest of the world. In conclusion, by conducting systematic research on Christian school cultures and community stakeholders, which includes governments and businesses, by the way, as well as uh, nonprofit organizations that may not have the same mission or th philosophy or theology as the schools, ACSI research has validated the concept of flourishing as offering a robust and expansive view of the purposes and processes of Christian education. And most importantly for educators, the FSCI and FSCM together provide measurable signposts on a roadmap toward flourishing Christian schools. Remember, this is the only research and survey of its kind. It has not been repeated. And it just got done literally the same year. And the and the year and the time this article was published is the same year that they just completed it. So there's no like oh like after some time this is how we compare the reality to the research or we or we did it again and the results were very much similar to the first time. No, it's. It's as a number of my fellow brethren say, scientism. Not science, scientism. Social science rule of thumb is scientism. And if you look through the references carefully, you'll notice that a fair number of them are from ACSI itself, and the rest are predominantly from non-Christians, if not anti-Christ, meaning people who don't give a care, don't give a lick about Jesus, God, or the Bible, or anything in, in, in like, your relation. But, but remember, one of the rising social challenges is the increase in secularism in society. Remember that. And one of the other challenges is diversity. <laughs> the other challenges to education is diversity, but we want the schools to be a, as diverse as possible, just for the sake of diversity. D-I-E, diversity, inclusion, and equity. D-I-E, that's, 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 a, that's a joke from one of my best friends who's a brother to me in the Lord. And please pray for him because he's currently re recovering from injuries and he has a growing family. Three children and a wife. Three boys and a wife. Uh, 
God bless that man. All right. Let us now head over to our final tidbit to conclude. Well, like I said, so the man in the left is Mr. Andy Wolf. We'll be listening more from him directly next in 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 you know in part two. This is the uh, this is the conclusion. The, uh, the concluding uh, the concluding session to the seminar from this which is uh, which is the which is the same as the same as the as the first video I showed you which was part one. Like I said, you can check this out on YouTube. Links will also be in the description. Let's see what Miss Swinger has to say about nature. How do we learn? How we use nature? How we use agrarian language? Agrarian language? Agrarian culture? To learn more about, well, not the Bible. You'll see what I mean. Thank Clashing Schools. We'll return to our scripture that we began with, which is John 10:10. 10, 10. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Some of your translations may say abundant life. And the question that we're seeking to ask and seeking to answer is. What does abundant life look like educationally? So what does educational abundance look like in your school that is from a Christian vision and is given and blessed by Jesus? And so I want to actually... From a Christian vision given and blessed by Jesus, based off of half of a verse, by the way. Remember that. Based off of half of a verse. Suggest to you a practice. It's a bit of a, a spiritual practice and a bit of an educational practice. And this is something actually that our, our schools we've suggested to you, they've tried it and found it to be extremely powerful and a little bit different from the spiritual practice, educational practice found to be extremely powerful. This isn't just this this isn't this isn't just a people say like, well, no, that's just something that people just say. No, no. There's a reason why people we say what we say, especially when it's off, you know, off the cuff. There are underlying things, like like for example, like for example, last episode, I said, said said the globe, in reference to the Earth. But my thing is, I rather not say globe, I rather not say planet. I'm going to stick with the world, the Earth. There's a number of reasons for that. You can speculate. You 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 can assume. But let's just say I'm not too fond of using terminology more so than that's you know that's not you know that's less biblical in nature because a lot of that is tied to things that are anti biblical or anti Christ, such as evolution and determinism, like blind determinism. Or even things that could be relations, such as you know being seated by aliens, or seated by aliens, like you know being seated by aliens, or even questionable, you know questionable you know, astronomy. I'm leaving it at that. Go ahead, and make your assumptions. I'll be talking more about that in the future. Look forward to it, or maybe you, you will, maybe you won't. Oh well. We gotta live more honestly, especially when we, especially when we know things. Anyways. Typical assessment strategies that you, you may be used to. Uh, and this is called Flourishing Schools Walks in the Garden. Remember, this is spiritual and educational, but primarily spiritual. Extra biblical. Roman Catholic, if not Jesuit, esoteric. Practice. You'll see what I mean soon. And this is actually taken directly from the book. The Bible was written during an expansive time period in which people were significantly more acquainted with agriculture than many are today. Jesus tells numerous parables and employs metaphors related to gardening, sowing, planting, watering, harvesting, pruning. In John's Gospel, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. 
And in Luke's gospel, when a frustrated landowner wants to cut down a fig tree that hasn't yet borne fruit, the gardener replies, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. And if not, then cut it down. To think about how insights... Then cut it down. Then cut it down. And do what with it? See, that's the thing. Do what with it? Throw it away into fire. Everlasting hellfire. There's no notion of sin, of judgment, of eternal separation, of being an enemy or a rebel against the Lord, because after all, as as Rose Hudson Wilkins said, everybody created in the image of God is a son of God. So yeah, we're going to talk about we need to talk about these things, even things that Jesus himself spoke of. From agriculture might apply in your school, we suggest that you assemble a team who will take regular learning walks. Much as you would walk around a public garden and stop in to notice the diverse plants, landscapes, and biomes, send your team members out for a set period of time, perhaps an hour, to take a walk through and around the school, perhaps once or twice a month. As you and the team walk, write down observations about places you and they observe educational flourishing and action. Yeah, and if you thought, oh, you're going to walk around and make observations about how plants function, how they live, their cycles, their stages, they're going to learn gardening, they're going to learn, you know, actually conduct science. Actually, you know, in order to gain a better understanding of, of an agrarian way of thinking, you learn... No, you... See, it's a psychological, it's a spiritual... Psycho, no, psychological, spiritual... It's psychological, it's a spiritual paradigm. Of how to evaluate the world around you. Places where additional sunlight or water might be needed to revive growth. Places where tiny green shoots are barely visible, but they're there. Places that seem to be overgrown with maybe too much activity and are in need of pruning back. Or places that are currently dormant or fallow, but that show promise for future cultivation. Encourage yourself not just to look for public displays, such as a well-polished lesson or a chapel sermon, but to seek out the quieter, the subtler garden beds such as the interaction between students during cooperative work, the layout and flow of the lunchroom, or the engagement of teachers and custodial staff. Remind yourselves and those with whom you may come into contact while walking that this is not a formal observation, but rather an invitation to see in a new and different way. A new and different way. New and different way. New revelations. New Testaments. With a non-punitive set of lenses. Lenses of a gardener. Lenses of a gardener. A human. A man. Not the lenses, not the eyes. Not the teachings, not... Not the word of the Lord but through human eyes. Who has the holistic, vibrant, bountiful flourishing of the garden in mind. And be sure to invite students to walk too. Holistic, bountiful flourishing of the garden. And you've gotten quite a bit of context on that. We're going to end here. Part two, flourishing schools, going over to that of the Church of England. This is Christian M.C. Fulmer. Hope you were edified. Be blessed. Signing out. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord hath been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children.
Ye are blessed of the Lord which made heaven and earth. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's. But the earth hath he given to the children of men. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord.